The North Carolina Tar Heels are the outright 2023-24 ACC regular season champions, and it's all thanks to a guy who a lot of Carolina fans wanted to see bench this season. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, this live postcast edition of the show as we wrap up the regular season. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you so much for joining us as we revel in a massive victory over Duke to wrap up the regular season. Very seriously, this is the place to be, and we are glad you're here. Big shout out to you everydayers who are joining us as always. All right. Folks, let's get right into this thing. North Carolina wins at Duke 84-79. Carolina runs their record on the regular season to 25-6, and 17-3 in ACC play. That's the best record they've had in the 20-game version of the ACC conference schedule. The previous best was 25-5. and five. Those of you looking, you see I'm wearing that Saturday outfit. It is still undefeated. I'm going to have to keep rocking this thing even as it gets hotter outside. This is another quad one victory for Carolina that should give them seven and 13 combined quad one and quad two wins. As we record, Ken Palm is not yet uh, refreshed and updated, so we will see. Y'all, I love it. The Tar Heels are your outright champions. We don't need tiebreakers. We don't need help from Pittsburgh or <laughs> um Wake Forest or anyone, Carolina takes care of business themselves. They end the regular season on a 6-0 and stretch. You know what you got to do to win the uh, national championship? You got to win six straight games. Carolina now twice this season has showed themselves capable of doing that. All right, here's how we handle um, when we do these live postcasts. I'm going to give you four things. We'll have a quick ad read, and then we'll look at four other things. So as we start to get into that, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the box score. For those of you watching, if you're listening back to this later, we're so glad uh, that you are here with us, but you can pull up the box score somewhere else. All right, you see it pulled up there for those of you watching on YouTube. I wrote this with about 10 minutes to go in the basketball game. There was no other place that I wanted to start, win or lose, Cormac stinking Ryan. Look, let's go back to all the noise, all the vitriol about bench Cormac. Get him out of there. Start Seth Trimble. Start Jalen Washington. Start Jalen Withers. This man continues to pour it on, has a season and career high 31 points in Cameron Indoor Stadium to wrap up his regular season college basketball career. You could ask for no better way to go out. And you love to see it. Carolina now has knocked off Duke uh, the past two senior days when they've played their, obviously, the big game at, at Coach K's final regular season game and Saturday night. It's so funny because we were talking X factors. There's always a big X factor in these games. And who is it going to be? Last time, it was Harrison Ingram shooting, and it was Seth Trimble's driving and getting those 10 points. What's really funny is that Cormac Ryan was clearly the X factor in this game. And I, I'm looking it up in real time because I'm pretty sure his stat line in this game was almost identical to what Harrison Ingram did in the first game against Duke. Here we go. I'm pulling it up. Harrison Ingram in round one was 8 of 12 from the field, 5 of 9 from three, no, no free throw attempts, but listen to Cormac's stats in this one. I, an identical eight of 12 from the field, six of eight from three. So he made one more three, took one less, but also nine for 10 at the free throw line. And all of that is so critical from what Cormac dig and did. And look, he started it right out of the gate in this game. Those back-to-back -back corner threes that were like was that instant replay? I think I think Jay Billis said on the call, no, that was him doing that. And then that third one that he hit within the first three and a half minutes where Cadeau had that great steal after Carolina had either missed or had a turnover and just kind of tossed it up to Cormac. And he, he nails it 
just right in Duke's eye. And here's what I love about that. Cormac then did not just start settling like heat check after heat check after heat check. He said, oh, I am a savvy sixth year college basketball player. You know what I know? When I'm on fire like this, they are going to be sprinting out at me on the perimeter. I'm a pump fake these dudes all night and get into the lane on them. He picked up Kyle Filipowski's second foul late in the first half by doing that exact thing. Early in the second foul, as Carolina hadn't been going to the free throw line much, he drove, got contact. So I just love his ability to do these things. Somebody asked me in the our, our live postcast after the Notre Dame game, hey, are we, are we going to see Cormac Ryan keep attacking like this? We absolutely are going to see it. And he did that all night long. Um, uh, getting Carolina back to the 10-point lead at 63-53, drawing a foul on Ryan Young, hit another three that put it back to a 10-point lead, 61-51. Um, got it back to a nine-point lead just under four minutes to go right after Duke could cut it to six and again to put it back to nine just under two to go and then he was an absolute dude at the free throw line in the final closing little bit of the game Cormac Ryan folks welcome you are a Tar Heel legend I know he started at Stanford had all those years in Notre Dame this performance for Cormac Ryan is going down in Carolina history books we will always always remembered. It was, it was a big part of Carolina's hot start. Um, and, and we can talk about that hot start here in just a little bit, because that was integral to Carolina's victory. But the second thing I want to go to is this earlier this week on one of our shows, I think it was with coach Rob on Thursday. I said some version of this, look, Duke often wins the off season and, and claims it and gets all over uh, social media about it. And that's great and good and whatever way to go, Duke, we're proud of you. Um, but Carolina this year is just simply the better basketball team. We thought we saw that in round one, and we certainly did here again on Saturday night. Here's what I mean. Carolina in game one led 38 minutes and four seconds of that game. Duke led for 16 seconds of that game. And in fact, the only 16 seconds it was, was when they were up two to nothing. North Carolina on Saturday night, never trailed. They scored the first bucket and then just kept pushing it out. So on Saturday night, North Carolina led for 39 minutes and 43 seconds. That means in totality, this regular season, Carolina and Duke have played twice. Duke led for 16 seconds. North Carolina led for 77 minutes and 47 seconds of basketball. Now, I know if you're adding that up, it's not exactly 80 because that takes into account ties early on. And um, that that all is um, critical stuff of Carolina just asserting themselves early in the first game and early in this one, particularly on the road, as we talked about, needed to be a big part of what Carolina did. And they did it, man. They did it so very well. Number three of what we want to get to. Once again, Carolina is able to get Kyle Filipowski in foul trouble, and it's a multitude of different Tar Heels that got him into foul trouble. You love to see that. I talked already about Cormac Ryan getting his second foul late in the first half, and then like a minute and a half into the second half, uh, Flip picks up his third foul. Coach Shire decided to stay with him, brought him out eventually, but then uh, Armando started abusing Ryan Young, by the way, the Duke's backup bigs were a big bag of nothing in this game. I think Sean Stewart, who had been performing better lately, we talked about him, like zero points, four fouls. At Ryan Young had like zero points, three fouls. I don't know if it uh, if that was what they finished with, but that's what it was late in the game. Yeah, Sean Stewart, zero points, four fouls, one rebound. Way to go, one block. Uh, Ryan Young, zero points, 0 of 2 from the field, three fouls, six boards. Way to go, but... Carolina, I, they, they just had nothing for Carolina inside there. Anyway, Flip, here's the thing. Despite him not picking up his fourth foul until um, Harrison Ingram drove on with like six and a half minutes to go, um, Flip stayed out of it for like those 12 minutes. But Coach Shire took him off of Armando and put him on whoever was playing the four, Harrison Ingram, Jalen Withers, whatever. So Armando, all he had to contend with was those other two guys we just talked about, Sean Stewart, who again has been playing better lately. Carolina rendered him 
moot in this game. And then um, Ryan Young didn't have anything for Armando either. And so, sure, great, Lee flip in the game, but he was hurting Duke by being in the game. Secondly, even when he was able to, to get in and do stuff, um, Carolina um, was it like he couldn't attack on the rebounds. And so Carolina would take advantage of that. And so uh, really, really um, great job on making flip. I mean, he was a factor in this game. What do you have? 23 points, like d- did a great job, but Carolina did what they needed to. They did enough on him to make that happen. And so um, you love to see that. All right. Last thing before we get to our um, break is talking about the bench. Look, the starters for you, you think about that last time when Carolina won on coach K's last regular season game, that was the birth of the iron five where the five Carolina starters played the entirety of the second half, literally never came out. All five of them played all 20 minutes. Not so in this game. As Carolina's bench, and, and critically with, you know, I know Paxson got a few minutes there. Zayden didn't play. James Oconquo didn't play. But it, this is really all about Jalen Withers, Jalen Washington, and Seth Trimble. And all three contributed and scored at least a couple points. Carolina outscored Duke's bench 14-7. to Earlier in the season, you might even recall, we looked a lot at Carolina's ability to get to 14 points off the bench. I believe it was last week, Coach Pat Kilby said he was looking for 15 points on an ongoing basis from Carolina's bench. I'm I'm on record as 10 to 15 is what I'm looking for. And that's what Carolina did. And in fact, until TJ Power hit like a desperation three late and uh, then drove, Carolina ran him off the three-point line and and he got a two. So until he got those five points in the final, you know, 30-ish seconds of the game, Carolina was outscoring Duke's bench 14 to two. You'll absolutely take that. So let's look at the individuals on it. Jalen Withers. His athleticism was on display in a big way in this game. Six points, all of them on putbacks, had eight rebounds, four offensive, four defensive, had a block, played 11 minutes. Um, As for Jalen Washington, he only had two points, but it was a vicious dunk off an R.J. Davis dish. Um, And I want to talk about Seth Trimble as well, because he didn't get up to 10 points like he did last time. He had six in this game, but he was, again, very aggressive, played the most minutes of the th- of the uh, main three bench guys. Um, I'm on Duke's part of the box score there. Let me get back to Carolina's. Um, played 20 minutes um, for Seth did, and so really good stuff there. He was three of five of the field. Had that beautiful curl around the top of the key and just got into the middle. Nobody was there. Beautiful finger roll. And then his other two were just little mid-range pull-ups that, that he buried. Um, Seth even, like that, that third shot that he made, was right after he got scratched. I think it was Mark Mitchell that scratched his eye. He made that shot and then committed a foul and came over to the bench. And you could read his mouth telling Hubert Davis, I can't see. And so Seth's out there doing it with that. But here's the crit- most critical thing that Seth does along with adding just some, some bonus points for Carolina. His defense is so dogged and so good. He had that right when he got his eye scraped. It was off a deflection that he created on a sideline inbounds pass for Duke, kind of like Harrison had against somebody uh, recently. might have been Virginia. I don't remember. I think it was Virginia, actually. Um, And then um, just Seth's defense running Duke off the three-point line. I know Duke made more threes in this game than they did in the first game, but still only made nine of them. Well, Carolina had seven. I mean, so Carolina basically played Duke even on threes and shot a better percentage. And so, man, Seth's defense is just so important. Great stuff there from Mr. Trimble. All right, guys, we got some more stuff we want to get to. But first, I need to tell you that our live postcast edition of North Carolina clinching the ACC regular season championship is brought to you by our good friends at FanDuel. North Carolina, the wait is almost over. Literally Monday, two days from now as we record, FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, is coming to the Tar Heel State. On March 11th, you'll finally be able to bet on all your favorite teams in all your favorite sports. With FanDuel, there's tons of ways for you to get in on the action. You can bet on everything from the money line, to over-unders, to uh, how Carolina's going to do in the ACC tournament coming up next week. All of that on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. 
Plus, with live betting, you can even pick which player will pick up the next bucket or the one after that. Probably Cormac Ryan on Saturday. So come see for yourself why FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on so you can be the first to know when FanDuel goes live in North Carolina. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel. All right, Isaac Shade here with you. We're unpacking Carolina's big time win over Duke to wrap up the regular season and an ACC outright championship. Love to see it. Look, here's the next thing we got to get to. Four more things, and then we'll go find your comments, which are going bonkers right now in the live chat. That's good stuff there, and I can't wait to get to it. Um, so keep bringing all those in. Um, I'm going to sound like a broken record with this next thing. North Carolina wins against Duke despite R.J. Davis not going off. Look, to Duke's credit, they continued to be able to put length on him to bother him. While the, the matchups were not quite the same in the backcourt for either team, both teams matched up a little bit differently. Carolina put um, Elliot Cadeau on Tyrese Proctor instead of Cormac Ryan, and Cormac was on um, Jared McCain. And um, so all of that's different turnaround last time rj i think was on jared mccain to start cormac on proctor and elliot on jeremy roach but duke while they changed a little bit as well they put roach on elliot cadeau instead of jared mccain the one thing the one thing that stayed the same was tyrese proctor on rj davis consequently rj one of the very few times this season was single digits in scoring nine points four of 12 from the field one of three from three Zero free throws. Didn't get to the line at all. Let's be honest. RJ should have been. There were so many times I thought Carolina was fouled that weren't called in this game. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. By the way, Carolina shoots 15 of 18 at the free throw line. Way to go, Tar Heels. We'll take that. Um, and, and RJ, two rebounds, three assists, three turnovers for him. There were a couple just kind of where it got away from him, and, and Duke had a couple run outs there, which makes me wonder what the – um fast break points were in this game uh carolina led 19 to 6 good grief way to go tar heels that's great anyway um just like the first game carolina wins despite rj not going off how how many times like i know that miami game where rj scored 42 points and everyone is all up in arms because nobody else scored in double digits and what's going to happen Look, you just look at everything that's been going on. That was in the midst of a stretch where four different Tar Heels led over the course of four different games. Carolina has been having such balanced scoring even in the midst of games. And in this one, obviously you well know because we already talked about it. Cormac Ryan, 31 points. The only other Tar Heel in double figures was Harrison Ingram who had a 14.10 rebound double-double. And I say all that to say, even if it's not balanced within a game, even if RJ's not the leading scorer, as he wasn't, again, just like the other game, he was tied. He was the third leading scorer, tied with Armando in this one with nine points. Um, Carolina has depth. They have balance. They don't, you know, last year, I feel like in particular, we, we worried about what happens if RJ or Caleb are off, who, who was able to go out and, and get buckets. And look, you're seeing it. Different dudes dominate in different games. I think, if I remember correctly, this is just Cormac's second time to lead the Tar Heels in scoring, but it's happened multiple times in the last couple games. The other one was against Virginia. So, ooh, how about that? The two times Cormac Ryan has led the Tar Heels in scoring this year have both been on the road, and it's at Virginia and at Duke. Come on. So, I would say, like, obviously, you wish RJ had a better game, but be encouraged that Carolina can do this without the dude that's about to get voted ACC player of the year, even getting to double figures. And you lump Armando in with that. RJ and Armando combined eight of 23 from the field, just 18 combined points for these two dudes. And yet Carolina goes into Hansboro indoor stadium and gets a five point win over Duke. I am so, so encouraged uh, by seeing something like that play out. All right, next thing we got to get to is a big part of Carolina winning this game is because yet again, they had a hot start and because yet again, they were the aggressors. And it's funny. It's almost comical because Coach Shire, all the Duke players after the first game were like, 
All right. We 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 didn't bring it. We weren't tough enough. We got to get there in the next game. And maybe they were ready to on their home floor, but they didn't. And I don't think it's because they weren't ready to. I think it's because this Carolina team is one of the toughest, grittiest, most aggressive teams I can remember in a long time from Chapel Hill. And, and it plays, I mean, there was a stretch. We talked about that, that Elliot Cadeau getting on the floor, tossing it up to Cormac. That was in a stretch where three different Tar Heels were on the ground in like a matter of a minute. Carolina was after every loose ball in this game. Jay Billis kept joking that they weren't 50-50 balls because Carolina was getting 100% of them. I'm like, you're spot on, Jay Billis, who does a great job, by the way. You know, like, man. And not only that, but just like the first game as Carolina got out to that quick lead, that was even more critical in this game. We, we talked about that on Friday's show because Carolina is out on the road and you got to get a lead because you know Duke is going to make a push. And so you got to give yourself some cushion. So Carolina, let me tell you some of these leads they got out to in this game. They led 10 to 2. Fifth, uh, make that 17 to 4. 27 to 12. And at that point, when Carolina was up 15 points at 27 to 12, RJ Davis had not yet scored a single point in this basketball game. So that even goes back to our previous point about what Carolina's able to do. Really good stuff. Again, Carolina was hustling. Uh, th those three guys that got on the floor, by the way, was Cadeau and then Cormac Ryan and then Armando Baycott. There was that one later where Cadeau saved another one. And, and we're going to talk more about Cadeau on Monday. So we haven't been talking uh, much about him yet, but we we certainly need to once, once we get to Monday. But he had another one that he saved... Um, what was it later in the game? And I, it wound up with Duke um, getting a three. And I don't remember who it might've been Jared McCain, who Jared McCain, man, I, I'm impressed again. His, his trigger from three is so good. Um, so love that there um, for Carolina, just once again, being the aggressors. Now, the seventh point that I want to make is, as I just said, Duke was going to make a push and they did. In the second half, it at one point it was like Kyle Filipowski eight, Carolina one, and at that point I'm bringing up the play by play as we talk about this. Um, remember, Carolina led um, what at at halftime. Uh, Tarios were up forty to thirty one because of that Jalen Withers put back right before halftime. That was a critical play, by the way. So anyway, forty to thirty one at halftime. Um, Duke comes out. Flip layup, flip jumper, and then he's just off and running. Then made a three, and it, before you knew it, it was eight to one. Kyle Filipowski over Carolina. They cut the lead at that point. It was forty three thirty eight, um, and they get it down to forty three forty two. And I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, all right, Tar Heels. A, this is why you built that big push cushion because you knew they were going to make a push. But now's the time. You either respond or you get blitzed out of this gym, and that's the fear. But again, this is a veteran, experienced Tar Heels team. If Duke wants to roll with some young dudes, a bunch of freshmen and sophomores, great, cool, do it. I'm not going to apologize for the Tar Heels being experienced. So from there, 43-42, North Carolina pushes it all the way out to 52-43, a nine-point lead. Duke, you know, cut it back again a little bit late, but Carolina had done too much, had built enough of a cushion that even with some turnovers down the stretch from Carolina, it wasn't enough. The closest Duke got was three, but then Cormac Ryan hit two free, three with five seconds left, I guess I should say. Um, Cormac hit those two closing free throws and it was over. So Carolina did a great job surviving the Duke push and responding in a big way in a hostile environment with Kyle Filipowski, the preseason ACC player of the year, by the way, getting hot. Carolina stopped it, and you love to see that. Number eight, our last thing, and then we will get to um, the looking at what you're saying on comments and stuff. North Carolina wins the rebounding battle 39 to 28 plus 11. That's going to help you every time you play a basketball game. Tar Heels had 12 offensive rebounds to Duke's 27. 
and uh, or sorry, Carolina had 12 offensive rebounds to Duke's eight and 27 defensive rebounds to Duke's 20. By the way, the Tar Heels out rebounded their opponents in all 20 ACC games. That's right. Carolina played 20 ACC games. They won the rebounding battle in all of them. Literally the only four games they've been out rebounded this year were UC Riverside, which is kind of funny. And then Kentucky, UConn and Oklahoma. That's it. Since Carolina played Charleston Southern and the rest of the regular season, they have been the ones to out rebound the opponent. Pretty cool stuff. All right. We are now going to get to looking at the comments. I want to take some questions and observations from you and see what we're going to do with those. But first, let me check Ken Palm one more time in real time. It has refreshed and Carolina is holding on at eighth in Ken Palm. But get this uh, offense is still 26th in offensive efficiency. But Carolina is now the fifth most defensive efficient team in the country. Thanks to this performance. Absolutely great stuff. <clears throat> Carolina winning at Duke. Okay, here we go. I'm going to leave the box score up while we get to this. Let's look at what you all have to say. Um, ooh, everyone's so excited. By the way, I just remembered this in my head as we're talking. Um, let's say this first before I even say that. Shadow Computing says, no therapy session needed tonight, Isaac. That's absolutely right. Shadow Computing, folks, for, for those of you that might be tuning in for the first time, when Carolina wins, we celebrate. When Carolina loses, it's a therapy session. So I had said earlier, hey, win or lose, we'll be chatting. Hopefully it's not a therapy session, and it's absolutely not. Way to go, Shadow Computing. Uh, can we talk about that Kyle flip trip, the flip trip, the trip flip, whatever you want to call it, little Grayson Allen thing? It was never looked at. The, the rest never went back to. I think it was on Harrison Ingram, right? And I, come on, man, that that's pretty insane. But whatever. Um, a couple of people talking about that Elliot Cadeau shot. You remember this? Big time now. When you think about it, uh, there's Carolina. The shot clock's running down. I think it was Baycott kicks it out last second to Cadeau, who hits this kind of ridiculous three that looked even on replay like it was just beyond the line. It was called a two. In real time, they stuck to a two. I think it was not confirmed. You know, one of the, like you, with the NFL refs, you're always listening for the vocab they use, whether it's um, call is confirmed, call stands, that kind of thing. I thought Elliot was behind the line. I saw like brown floor between the tip of his shoe and the three-point line. So I, I don't really know where they went with that, but whatever, we'll take it. Anyway, um, Michael, what's up, Michael? Always good to see you. Says, hey, people, that was a team effort. Our two best options held in check. That's RJ and Armando both having nine points. And as we said, uh, just eight of 23 from the field. And still, Dukey can't beat us. And, and this is the difference between the first game and this one. Remember the first game, Armando went off 10 of 13 from the field, 25 points. But in this one, even though only two Tar Heels, Cormac and Harrison, were in double figures, you had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Tar Heels that scored six or more points. Good luck beating the Tar Heels if they're getting that kind of contribution. So great point there from Michael. Um, man, you absolutely love to see that. Um, James Pruitt says, did anyone notice Duke inbounded the ball at 16.3 seconds on the clock and it didn't start until the, they had the ball over half court? line. Uh, James, I'm guessing, you know, about the, the, you know, un, when a ball is inbounded until it's touched, the clock doesn't start. And I think that was Jared McCain, uh, being the one to bring that up. It looked like he touched it, but he didn't. And then he just kept pretending and getting really close to the ball, but he never touched it until right after it got across half court. So that's why the clock never started there. I, I at first, um, was like, huh, what? I thought he touched it, but I went back and look and, and he didn't. So um, actually, unfortunately, right call. Uh, Shadow Computing, let's bring this back in because we need to talk about what happened post game here. It says the crazies throwing water at North Carolina after the game was one of the funniest things I saw all night. So you might have seen if you're watching the broadcast, Carolina wins, they go over, they're waving by. That's like the thing now in college basketball is to silence the crowd and wave bye to the crowd. Uh, have fun on your way home, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Carolina goes over, you know, fine, whatever. Um, 
it wasn't like Blake Henson standing on the on the uh, um, scorers table there like he did after he went nuts at Duke, but that's fine. Um, Carolina just good naturedly waving, and the Duke students start throwing water at him. Water, I tell you. But we probably won't hear about that like we heard about the court storming now, will we? No, 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 no. That's clearly not a deal to throw water on college students. But sure, let's let's make a massive ordeal out of the out of the court storming thing. Okay, cool. I see. I see what's up. Very good. Keep keep that energy. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just I, I can't with that. Um, Michael, we brought him in, but I, I want to bring this in as well and say this. Uh, he says, as long as Carolina does don't lose in the ACC tournament quarterfinals, we should be the last number one seed in the big dance. Let's have that conversation here briefly. Obviously, we'll talk about it more as this week goes on. Three of the one seeds are locked in place regardless of what happens next week. And that's UConn, who won the Big East regular season by like four games. They've only got three losses on their resume. Um, Houston, who obliterated Kansas outright ACs or outright Big 12 champs in their first year in the conference, three losses themselves. And then Purdue, outright Big 10 champs, three losses to their resume. Those are your top three seeds in some order. The fourth, as you well know, is up for, for up for grabs. And kind of some of it's going to be dependent upon what has happened here in the closing stretch of the regular season, along with what happens next week. The other teams, along with Carolina, that are involved in this possibility are Tennessee, whom I believe has, or at least had <laughs> until today, the inside track, Arizona, Duke, and Iowa State to a little bit of a lesser degree, perhaps. Let's look at what the other teams did. How did Duke do today? I think they lost. So that takes them off. They've been swept in the regular season by Carolina. That's got to mean something. Um, Tennessee lost at home today to Kentucky. Almost had a great comeback win, but didn't. They were already the SEC outright champs. So we'll see what happens there. Um, and where things fall, and and we'll have to look at resumes. Obviously, it's great that Carolina has the head-to-head -head win over Tennessee. This is where that will start to come into play. Uh, Arizona is the Pac-12 outright champions, but because the Pac-12 is not as strong, I just don't think they have the same resume. Um, and now, you know, one of the biggest things on their resume is they went into Cameron Indoor, and how about that? Caleb Love and the Tar Heels won at Duke. <laughs> That's great. I just thought about that. Love it. Anyway, um, one of the biggest things on Arizona's resume this year is winning at Cameron. Well, now Carolina has that as well. So, so you look at a lot of that and, and that comes into play. Iowa State also lost on Saturday. So Carolina has firmly entrenched themselves in position to at, at like have a good a shot as any of these other teams at that fourth one seed. And I think Michael's right. You cannot lose in the quarterfinals. And I think you would do yourselves well to win in the semifinals. But hear me say this. Obviously, it will depend some on what other teams around the nation do. I think Carolina has put themselves in a position because of what they've done this regular season to not have to win the ACC tournament to get that fourth one seed. Now, let's say Arizona gets that Pac-12 championship and looks insanely good. That's going to come into play. Let's say... Um, Tennessee wins the SEC championship and does it going away with the way Kentucky's coming on a little bit lately. We'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, the SEC has got a lot of teams that could pull that off. Um, I don't, I, I honestly think Lee think Iowa state with losing today kind of plays their way out of that. And I think Duke, even if they won the ACC tournament doesn't have enough to get it either. So, I mean, honestly, it might now be down to Arizona, Carolina and Tennessee for that fourth one seed. So we'll keep obviously our eyes on that. Oh man, you guys, I just want to pause before I get to the next um, thing and say, what a special season. I know it's not over. There are uh, still more games to be played, but we're to the point now where there are no more than two more guaranteed games the rest of the season, right? We, we don't expect that to happen, but if Carolina lost their first ACC game and their first NCAA tournament game, season's done. So we're at that point where there are no more than two guaranteed games remaining. However, Carolina could play as many as nine more games. So I just say all that to say, what a regular season. Drink it in. We got till Thursday. 
And then we going to get happy. We're going to uh, enjoy every bit of this ride as we already are. Okay, um, let's keep looking at it. The, here's the other nice thing about putting yourselves, by the way, back in contention for that, that fourth one seed is you don't, if you get that, you don't have to worry about Houston or UConn or Purdue until the final four. And who knows what could happen between now and then. I know some of the other two seeds are really good as well. But I, I, to me, that's the biggest reason to get that one seed. By the way, here's what else I think this, this win locks up is Carolina playing their first two rounds in Charlotte. So that's really good news as well. Um, let's see if we can just get another couple things and then we'll get out of here. Nintendo nerd. Oh, we haven't had anything from Nintendo nerd yet, but Nintendo nerd says it's my birthday and we got the dub and stomped Duke. I am so happy right now. Nintendo nerd. Happy birthday. It couldn't get any better. You love to see it. Woo, baby. That's great stuff there. Um, <laughs> Creator Classroom. What's up, Creator Classroom? Always good to see you. Uh, because of my outfit, for those who aren't aware, the reason I talked about that earlier, I've worn this same outfit for like the last six or seven Saturdays. Carolina's won all of them. And so instead of saying, go where you go and do what you do, Creator Classroom said, wear what you wear and do what you do. I love that. Way to go, Creator Classroom. That is brilliant. Um, <laughs> Seth Lipsay says, this question is from Nintendo, but I don't know what, what question it is. Maybe it's just because that's what we usually uh, do there. So, um, oh, here we go. It was Derek. Derek Thiessen says, remember when I asked if uh, Cormac Ryan being aggressive would continue? Well, we got our answer. What a legendary performance. Thank you, Derek. I couldn't remember who it was that asked me the other day, but yeah, we sure did get our answer. Uh, love to see that so much. All right, um, folks, that's great. So I'm sure there's more great things that you've asked and that we'll get to. I'll scroll through those and find them, but we've talked long enough here. We're still celebrating. I, I can hear you screaming and yelling from here. Absolutely uh, love to hear it. It's great to be together tonight. This is one of the biggest crowds on a live postcast we've had all season. So thanks to everyone uh, for tuning in there. It's great to be together. All right, y'all. We will obviously talk again on Monday, um, getting more unpacking of this, starting to look at uh, look ahead. I haven't even stopped to look at who the po potential combatants are that Carolina will play on Thursday, and we won't know the actual opponent until some point Wednesday. Um, but that's the nice thing is it's going to be somebody that's already played a game. So we'll get all sorts of ready for that. Y'all, say it with me. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Doesn't it feel good to get back here? First outright ACC championship since 2017. Is that right? Yes, because it was shared in 2019. Oh, boy. All right, we're going to talk again Monday. We've got to. You be here. I'll be here. But until then, peace. <laughs>